There was a time in my life when I listened to country music, and so uh, I was thinking about country music the other day, and, uh, and some songs uh, kind of come back to you at the weirdest times, but uh, you might know this. Any country music fans out there? Yes. All right, more of you than I want. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, man, and so... Uh, <laughs> Here we go, back to my roots. Uh, the book, uh, the group, super group Alabama comes from the great state of Alabama, Roll Tide. And so, uh, hey, this is a song they sang a long time ago when I would uh, go to their concerts. It said, I'm in a hurry to get things done. Oh, I rush and rush until life's no fun. All I really got to do is live and die, but I'm in a hurry and I don't know why, right? You want to sing it, don't you? And so, uh, Hey, uh, I thought that song really went with Luke chapter 10, and so kind of came back to me the other day through a video somebody sent me, but we wear busyness as a badge of honor, don't we? You ask somebody, you probably ask them today, how's how's your week? Busy. It was good, but it was busy. Uh, If you feel like you can't say you're not busy, right? You can't feel like, no, everything's good, (laughs) you know? Everything's laid back, and you feel like, oh, you're a slacker, right? And so... um, (laughs) As we, as we head into July refresh, I wanted to take one Sunday to get our minds and hearts in the right place. And so if you're here today for the first time or you haven't been really kind of tracking with us, let me just explain what this means. July refresh is going to be a time of refreshing. We're going to take off of everything except for 1030 worship service, okay? Okay. And so if this is your first Sunday here, this is not the norm, but it will be the norm in the month of July. And why do we want to do that? Because you and I live at a rate, a pace of life that is unsustainable. And you may not admit it, but that song describes your life better than probably most songs. (laughs) I'm in a hurry to get things done. And so uh, we're going to take a month. And we're going to have worship. We're going to have, we're going to have prayer the second Sunday of the month, not the first Sunday because it's July 2nd. And I know I'll be the only one here. Right. And so uh, a couple of you would show up just to make yourself feel better, but uh, um, we're going to do it that second Sunday. But other than that, we're not going to have uh, Sunday school and we're not going to have Wednesday nights because we want to take a month to give our hearts a chance to be in a better place when August comes because August is coming. If you're a teacher in this room, August is coming sooner than you wanted it to, right? Anybody with me know a teacher? If you do know a teacher or a school administrator, you should pray for them. This is the shortest summer of their career, right? So we want to take a a month just to kind of get our hearts in a good place. If if we're going to understand the teaching that Jesus is about to lay down in in Luke chapter 10, um, the, the July refresh will be maybe one of the most meaningful months you've had in a long time. If you've been around church for a while, you don't take breaks. If you're a Sunday school teacher, you signed up for eternity, right? Uh, When the person recruited you, they they never said, oh, next year you'll have a chance to re-up. They just said, how's it going? We'll we'll get you your new material, and uh, here you go. We don't care if you're tired. And so um, uh, if we don't get into the right place, We'll just be at church less in July and we'll miss the point of the refresh. So I, I, I pray by the end of this sermon, it'll be crystal clear why you and I need a time of refreshing. If it's not, come and ask me and I'll do my best to explain it one more time. Okay? If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, turn to Luke chapter 10. It is not the next passage in Luke, but it is the passage we're going to go through today. So. Uh, When we get there, if you get there, if you'd say word, um, that'll let us all know that you found the book and chapter. This is your first time here. We do this every Sunday. And so if you're like, what? And so they're going to say word as long as you keep coming and uh, as long as I'm the pastor. And so um, that'll let us, all of us know you found the right book and chapter. This is the word of God. Um, I've been thinking about this passage for a few weeks. I, I heard a sermon by a pastor named Neil McClendon a few weeks ago on one of my commutes between here and Somersault. And, and ever since then, I actually listened to it twice. I listened to it on the way up to Sumter and the way back down to Somersault with our students. And so I'm going to use his three main points. And so I'm going to give him credit for that. And so if you know, Neil, tell him word. And so uh, if you don't, then you'll be like, thanks for telling us that, Tim. We have no idea who this guy is. He's not a famous preacher. 
So uh, there, there's a bunch of us that, you know, aren't famous. And so um, this morning, though, I'd like us to look at Luke chapter 10 and think about what God cares about. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Um, the point of today is to not miss the good portion. So Luke chapter 10. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. I'm going to give you the big idea. It's rather long, so I hope you have a teaching sheet. If you don't, get up and get one, because you're not going to be able to write this down. Okay, I'm going to say it three times, but here we go. If we live our lives distracted, anxious, and troubled about many temporal things, we will miss the one thing that is necessary, enjoying Jesus as the good portion which is eternal. If we live our lives distracted, anxious, and troubled about many temporal things, we will miss the one thing that is necessary, enjoying Jesus as the good portion, which is eternal. If we live our lives distracted, anxious, and troubled about many temporal things, we will miss the one thing that is necessary, enjoying Jesus as the good portion, which is eternal. Okay, everybody with me? That's the whole big idea behind where I'm going today. We're gonna to start, we're just gonna go verse by verse. It's just a few verses today. Verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. So Luke is giving us a lot of details here. He's saying basically Martha is the hostess with the mostess, okay? She is there to host Jesus, which is really quite unusual. You see, in Jesus' day, a, a Jewish rabbi or a re religious leader would, would never receive hospitality by a woman this way. Yet Jesus, time and time again, doesn't seem to even want to acknowledge the man-made rules that they have set up. Notice the posture of the two women. Martha is distracted and she is serving and Mary is sitting and soaking in every word that comes from Jesus' mouth. Look at verse 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. So this, this first point is going to seem kind of harsh, but I credit Neil, and I'm just going to repeat it. And I, I try to brace it a little bit. There are things in your life that God does not care about. And in parentheses, as much as you do. Okay? I did that to soften the blow. He didn't put that in there. I put that in there. Okay? Let me phrase it another way. God is not someone who cares about everything you care about. Let me tell you what I am not saying. I am not saying God doesn't care about you. I would never say that. No one should ever look into your life and say, God doesn't care about that. Why do you care about that? That's the Holy Spirit's role. That's not our role, right? So listen again to Martha's question for Jesus. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. So let me just ask you this question this morning. Do you really need God to answer your questions or can you just answer them all by yourself? Because see, Martha, I don't think there was a pause there. She just answered that question all by herself. She asked Jesus a question and then she said, tell her then to help me. Jesus, that's the answer. I want you to repeat that back to me. Do you ever do that when you're talking to somebody and they try to, you kind of pause for a second and they try to complete your sentence? I do this to people sometimes because I'm impatient, right? And so you, you try to fill in what they're about to say, and if you're married to this person, uh, they don't want you to do that. <laughs> they're not, it's not a guessing game. It's not a game show. <laughs> they're just pausing for a second. 
Some of us pause for a little too long, but let's just keep on going, okay? Do you really need God to answer your questions, or can you just answer them all by yourself? Does Jesus know the answer to her question? She just assumes he would rather her question, uh, answer her question like she would. <laughs> Tell Mary to get up and help me. No more sitting, more serving. Lord, do you not care? Notice Jesus does not answer her question. <laughs> so maybe in just a little bit of a way, he was like, no, I, I don't care. That makes you very uncomfortable. Well, get ready, because it's about to get uncomfortable. <laughs> this is what Neil said. He said, if I was your sister, I'd leave you to serve alone because your life doesn't look that interesting. You look covered with sweat, guilt, and determination. You think I'm blunt. Okay. Uh, I, I thought that, that quote, though, just, it was kind of piercing. For those of you who like to serve, in the church, sometimes to the outside observing world, our lives don't look that interesting. They, looked, they look covered with sweat and guilt and determination. You see, Martha related to Jesus out of assumption, not intimacy. You don't want to get to the point where you answer your own questions to God, <laughs> all right? Where you don't need him to come through. Because let me just give you the, the next step that you may not realize is that you don't need him at all. You see, Martha's version of Jesus is not compelling. Her version is hollow. Her version of Jesus looks like Build-A-Bear, right? You fill him up with whatever you think is best, not what the Bible has to say about him. And this kind of Jesus is not worth the sacrifice. But the Jesus of the Bible, the real Jesus, not the build a God version of Jesus, is worth it all. To be Diana Bile said this You probably met Martha before. She is happy to serve, but somehow her serving makes her sour. She's a little bossy. Tell her to give me a hand. She's a little impatient with people she thinks, she's, she thinks aren't helping enough. Churches can be full of Marthas. Second, Martha is bold. She's got a rag in one hand and the other hand on her hip. Third, Martha accuses the Lord of not caring about her serving alone. So verses 41 through 42, you can know the things God does care about. So maybe God doesn't care about some of the parts that you care about a whole lot, but you can know the things that God does care about. Where do we find those things in the Bible? Verses 41 and 42, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. So what is distracting you from sitting at the feet of Jesus and soaking up every word he says? If someone said, give me three words to describe people today, let me, let me give you the three words that I would describe you, okay? Okay. Distracted, anxious, and troubled. This is a rhetorical question, but would anybody disagree? Okay. When you meet people on a daily basis, aren't they distracted, anxious, and troubled? Distracted by their phone, distracted by many things, and they are anxious and troubled. We are distracted, anxious, and troubled about many things. But let me just ask the question, verse 42 makes us want to ask, what is the one necessary thing? What Jesus is saying right here is that there is one necessary thing, and it is greater than all the many things. 
You see, social media has made us all too aware of all the things. Have you heard that phrase? If you hang out with young people, you'll hear these phrases and sometimes they just say them like you're supposed to know what that means. They'll be like, all the things. And I'm like, what are all the things? And so it's also kind of sold us this FOMO mindset, that fear of missing out. Just because something is going on, it is not necessary. Just because something is happening, it is not necessary. So when you and I start to focus on the one necessary thing, I think you'll find these things to be true, okay? Are you ready? This has really helped me. I've heard this a few years ago and it just keeps coming back over and over in my life, but will it matter five minutes from now? When something happens to me, or when my, my kids do something in the house, I have to say to myself, will this matter in five minutes? Sometimes it will, <laughs> right? But then I have to go a step farther. This is what I do in my head, okay? Will this matter in five hours from now? Will this matter in five days from now? Will this matter in five years from now? Will this matter in five decades from now? Do you see how when you kind of start pulling back, kind of like Google Earth, <laughs> things get less and less necessary? I heard this phrase when I was in college, and I, I think it's true. There are many things that are temporal, but only a few that are eternal. God, his word, and the souls of people. God, his word, and the souls of people. I remember when I was uh, a college student at the University of Alabama, I heard that phrase, and I thought to myself, I want to try my best to invest my time and energy into those three things. In whatever career, God, you would have me have, I would want to invest my life in God and his word and the souls of people because those seem to be the necessary thing. Verse 42, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. See, Mary has chosen the good portion. Portion, In other words, Martha, you have chosen the bad portion. <laughs> and it will be taken away from you because you can't be trusted with it. There's a commentator named Bach, and he said this, It is better to be a listening disciple than an immaculate host. What is the one thing that is necessary? What is the good portion? There's a statement of faith called the Westminster Catechism, and it says this, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. It seems like two things, but it's actually one. Glorify God by enjoying him forever. And so I want to take you to just Psalm 37, 4 really quickly. Because I think it answers the question of the one necessary thing for us just point blankly. It says this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. In a distracted, anxious, troubled culture, we immediately jump to the second part of the verse, right? <laughs> Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give me the desires of my heart, right? Jesus, I heard you. If I do something with you, we, we play some games together, you're going to give me the desires of my heart. <laughs> but so many people miss the good portion. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. I think that is the good portion. I think that's what we find Mary doing at the feet of Jesus. And that's what we find Martha missing over and over again. See, Mary is known for intimacy with Jesus, not refilling the charcuterie boards. God reveals to you as much as he knows he can trust you with. Luke 12, 48, it's a couple of chapters later, says, everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. I think Jesus understood that Mary 
was delighting in him. So let me go through the three points and get to the third one. There are things in your life that God does not care about, maybe as much as you do, which makes us feel a little bit better. You can know the things God does care about. And the third point is knowing the things God cares about makes all the difference. If you and I could figure out what God cares about and what he doesn't really care about, it would make all the difference. And so I want to take us to another gospel. It's the gospel of John, John chapter 12, same characters, some a similar situation, Okay. John chapter 12, verses one through eight. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Mary served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Let me just stop there. Anybody see something normal? <laughs> Martha was serving. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. <laughs> And so I think he's happy to be at the table, right? <laughs> he's reclining at the table. He's going, this guy, Jesus, he walked up to my grave and said, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> and he said my name so that everybody wouldn't come forth. <laughs> Did you get that? And so Lazarus is there reclining at the table. Martha is serving. And Mary shows up. Mary, therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who he was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. In another gospel, that 300 denarii is described as a year's worth of wages. All right, let's just ballpark it here, okay? Let's just go with, a, with, a, with an average wage. Let's just go with $30,000. So Mary walks in with a, with a jar of ointment worth $30,000. Let's just say it like that. And Judas acts like he cares about what God cares about, but the Bible tells us he doesn't care about what God cares about. He really only cares about Number one, Judas, right? So Jesus says, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. You see, Martha's doing what she knows to do. She's doing what she always does. And Mary is doing what she always does. <laughs> she is lavishing her love on Jesus. People that are intimate with God do extravagant things. <laughs> Selfish people do predictable things. People that are intimate with God do extravagant things, but yet selfish people do predictable things. Judas Iscariot is so predictable. If you've read the Gospels, <laughs> you can see it coming. The Bible even tells us he's going to betray Jesus He's saying, this is such a waste. Where is the budget committee, guys? <laughs> right? Acting like he cares about what God cares about. But if you focus on many things and not the one necessary thing, you will not understand what is happening around you. So let me put it like this to us. Without a clear understanding of the one necessary thing, coming to church, living for Jesus, where you live, work, and play can be like going to a 3D movie without the glasses. Anybody been there before? Anybody found yourself in a 3D movie without the 3D glasses? The screen is blurry. <laughs> and you wouldn't want to sit there. I don't even really like 3D movies. They, they were cool as a kid, but now I get kind of like, ooh, I have to wear these glasses. 
But I'll tell you, when I wear the glasses, though, everything pops. <laughs> I know exactly what's happening. I know the pie that's about to come towards my face. <laughs> you see things one way, but if you do not have those glasses on, you are missing out, and you're only catching a fraction of what is happening. If you come to church focused on many things, you will miss so much of what is going on. At some point in my Christian walk, I realized that church is more about Jesus and equipping the saints for the work of the ministry than it is about me and my preferences. I started to see Jesus and people in a different way, I think in a more healthy way. Let me say it like this. When we don't have a clear picture of the one necessary thing, the good portion, our preferences will become our default excuses. See, that kind of thinking revolves around a person's preferences, not around one necessary thing. If you've been around church life for a while, let me just kind of describe a little bit. If this is your, one of your first times around church life, let me just admit that we're not perfect. When all someone can talk about is what the preacher was wearing or not wearing, what someone else was wearing or not wearing, what songs we didn't sing, they are missing the point of gathering to worship Jesus and equipping the saints. And let me just go out on a limb, okay? I'm already stepped into it, right? This is why the dying world finds our lives so uninteresting. Because all they hear us talk about are the many things. But what we should be going out talking about is the one necessary thing. But you and I have to understand and see it clearly because Mary gets that Jesus is about to die. So she was anointing him for his burial. And John 13 is the next chapter, the last week of Jesus's life. So let me just say this phrase again. People that are intimate with God do extravagant things. <laughs> Some of us have never done anything extravagant for God. We've never worn the 3D glasses. Maybe we don't realize how much Jesus is worth. If you don't hear anything else I say today, let me make this point abundantly clear. He is worth it all. He's worth everything. He's worth every bit of sacrifice. He's worth every bit of serving. He's worth every bit of perfume. Can you imagine what a bottle of perfume that is worth a year's wage smells like? It must have been very concentrated. Have you ever been around middle school boys? Uh, middle school boys, for the person who, I think it was Satan who invented Axe body spray. And so um, <laughs> middle school boys understood that as a way to camouflage them not taking a shower. Okay. I've had, I got a middle school boy and we don't buy Axe body spray. I don't even think my son knows what it is. Okay. Unless he goes in the locker room and he's like, wow. So walk in, I had a, had a friend who her son was middle school and she walked into his bathroom one time and he was laying on the floor and the whole room smelled like Axe body spray. And she was like, son, what are you doing? He said, I'm just letting it rain, mom. <laughs> For those of you who don't have middle school boys, bath and body works. It's just overwhelming. It's like olfactory, is that the right word? Sensory overload. Like I go in there, I get what I need. The ladies who work in there, I think their, their senses are dead. And so, uh, but um, this is the kind of extravagant, concentrated smell. And this is a week until Jesus is crucified and killed in a very public way. You and I need to figure out what God cares about. 
You don't want to go to church all your life and miss the main point. Do you think the Roman soldiers who nailed Jesus to the cross could still smell Mary's extravagant gift? <laughs> Do you think they had smelled anything like that? I bet they were saying to each other, what is that smell? It's just a week. Just think about how concentrated that must have been. And those guys were like, who is this guy that somebody would have done this before he was buried? Because remember Lazarus? The Bible says he stinketh, right? <laughs> it's probably the KJV. And so uh, it, it's understanding Mary got it. So many others didn't get it, but she got it. She knew the one necessary thing. Forgive me for going to one more passage. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16, this fragrance of the knowledge of him is everywhere. We are the aroma of Christ. So when we understand what is worth caring about and we discern the things that are temporal, we can see Jesus very, very clearly. When we understand what we can't hold on to, our lives will become fragrant to others. So how do you wrap this up? Okay, I'm gonna try my best. If we live our lives distracted, anxious, and troubled about many temporal things, we will miss the one thing that is necessary, enjoying Jesus as the good portion, which is eternal. The temptation here is to say, am I a Martha or a Mary? Which one am I more like? And at one point in the sermon preparation, I had a scale. I had Martha on one end and Mary on the other end, and I was going to have you rate yourselves. <laughs> All right? But what I found as you, you look at the Bible longer and longer and longer, that you actually start to understand what it's saying. <laughs> and I think that would have been an adventure in missing the point. Because either you would have walked out of here feeling really good about yourself or really bad about yourself. And that's not what I'm trying to do. So let me kind of bring it home in a, in a different way. Some of us have a bend towards serving and some of us have a bend towards sitting and soaking. And Jesus is saying, look at me. Don't miss how great is your God. So let me give us five things that I think will help us enjoy Jesus as the good portion. Number one is knock, knock. Talk to Jesus often. Knock, knock. Talk to Jesus often. Uh, my youngest son is nine years old, and his question of the day is, can I go outside and play? <laughs> Don't you miss those days? We just went out there and rode bikes with your friends and nobody cared. So he has some friends that are in another country that live right down the street. The, the kids are in the country. The parents are here. Okay. So Corbin periodically during their time away has gone down there and knocked on their door knowing they're not there. Okay. Because I've seen him. He will go up to their front door and he said, I, the other day I called him and I, he, he, he kind of rode back to the house and I said, hey buddy, your friends aren't back yet. He said, I know. He said, but, but every time I knock on their door, their dad answers. He said, I know what kind of car their dad drives. So when I, I just want to knock on that door because I like when he answers the door. <laughs> Isn't that funny? This is like reasoning with a nine-year-old here. He said, I, I just like to ask him, hey, how, how much longer until they come back? So I was, I was thinking about this the other day and how much God likes us just to knock, knock. <laughs> and how he always answers the door. 
He's never irritated with you. <laughs> I got some friends, uh, one of Corbin's friends came and knocked on our door yesterday and I had the blinds shut. I didn't answer the door, okay? And so uh, me and this dad, we're different, okay? And so, and then later on, I saw him riding his bike and I explained Corbin's not here. So anyways, just to let you know, I'm a sinner. And so, um, <laughs> but I thought to myself, um, how many times we just need to, to knock, knock? Just say, God, I, I am worried about these temporal things. All of us in this room could say right now, I am distracted, distracted, anxious. What's the other one? Troubled. Thank you so much. Sometimes you need a little help. <laughs> Number two, what are some things that I care about too much? What are some things that I care about too much? That'd be a great question to ask God, but it'd also be a great question to ask the people who know you best. <laughs> You ask your best friend that or you ask your spouse that and they're probably, they got a list. And if they're patient and kind, they'll kind of, they'll, they'll release it slowly, right? When you watch the way I live, what do I care about too much? Number three, what does your life smell like? What does it smell like? Remember the verses? It either smells like life or death. And I've been around a lot of Christians. I've been in church a long, long time. And some of them, I don't want to be like them. Their life smells like death. It smells like a middle school boy with Axe body spray and overload, right? Or worse than that, it smells like a little boy who's never found anybody spray. <laughs> it reminds me of the locker room, and I'm like, your life smells like death. And if we were friends, I might just say, hey, brother, no one finds you. No one wants to model their life after you. I softened it, right? What does your life smell like? Number four, marinate your heart daily in the word and ask the Holy Spirit to transform your aroma. For some of us, we're like, man, I'm kind of in between. I, I don't smell great all the time. The aroma of Christ is not always on me. But if you and I would marinate our heart daily in the word and ask the Holy Spirit to transform your aroma. I said this a few weeks ago. I'm just going to say it again. If you would spend five minutes in the word on a daily basis, it would be better than one, to one or two 30-minute quiet times a month. Because it's like when you marinate meat, all you grillers out there, it just helps. They'll say, like, leave it in the, leave it in the marinade for at least an hour but what's best is overnight, right? So you and I, if we could soak our hearts in the word of God and we could just say, God, help me to remember the one necessary thing. Because I get distracted all the time by the many things. Number five is really I stole it from my wife. So I stole a lot of this sermon from other people. So here we go. Stole most of it from Luke. And uh, enjoy Jesus. If you've been around church for a while and you're like, I don't know about this. <laughs> I don't really find this kind of Jesus compelling. What I would tell you is I think you have a build-a-bear version of Jesus in your mind. Because the Jesus of the Bible, the real Jesus, is extremely compelling. You and I should desire to enjoy him. To delight ourselves in the Lord. And then he will give you the desires of your heart. But you got to do the first part. <laughs> so 
in the month of July, when you're sleeping a little bit later on Sunday mornings, or maybe for some of you early risers, you're like, I'm not going to sleep in anyways, Tim. Well, you're better people than us. And so uh, um, if you're coming into church around 10 or so, and you're like, oh, this doesn't feel right. I don't want you to, to bring that guilt and sweat and determination back. <laughs> what I, I'd love you to remember is to enjoy Jesus. Maybe come a little early, stay a little late. You'll be amazed at what the body of Christ around you can do for your spiritual soul. <laughs> enjoy Jesus. <laughs> he truly truly is the savior of the world. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that we do not have to stay <clears throat> in a hurried lifestyle all the time. We don't have to be distracted and troubled and anxious all the time, Jesus. Jesus. We can actually sit with you, enjoy you, let you minister to our hearts. Father, for the person today that has found themselves to be more like Martha than Mary, And maybe, Jesus, they've been trying to clean themselves up before they think they are acceptable to you. I pray that they would hear the truth of the Bible. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And that there's nothing we can do to clean ourselves up, Jesus. But you want us to put our faith in you, a holy God who is capable and able and overwhelmingly our best option to clean our souls up. But first, we've got to put our faith in you, Jesus. Because there's no shower or wash rag or behavioral modification that we could practice to get us into a state where we're good enough for you. Jesus, I pray that they would cry out to you today on the mercy of God and they would say, God of all mercy, would you save me? Because I am a sinner and in need of a savior. And Jesus, you're the only one. I'm so weary and tired and anxious and troubled about being your enemy. I want to be your child. God, would you save me today? And the Bible says that we'll, if we confess our, with our mouth that you are Lord and that God raised you from the dead, that we will be saved. Father, I pray that no one in this room would overcomplicate this but the simplicity of the gospel that Jesus, you are the, the one and true sacrifice for us. That you did what we needed to do. <clears throat> that you paid the price that we needed to pay. And you did it by living a holy life and giving your hands to the nails on the cross and by resurrecting from the dead so that we could see that you have power over sin and death, and so we have power over sin and death through you, Jesus. And so today we put our faith in that. For those in the, in the room right now who are weary, they have been serving and serving and serving, I pray that this next few weeks would be a time of refreshment where they would enjoy you, Jesus. For those in the room looking for a church home, I pray that they would come and be a part of this body of Christ. Lord, that they would come and they would be equipped and they would see more and more clearly the one necessary thing, the good portion of by delighting in you, Jesus. It would help center our whole lives. And Jesus, I pray as we um, even enter this last time of worship, 
I pray that you would help us, Jesus, to see you clearly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.